uh, of the teachings. Um, I just want to congratulate you because many, many people uh, don't have that stick to witness to stay to the end, but you did. And so God bless you and we thank God for you. Um, and this is the end. It seemed like it, as it had just begun, but this we have, we have come to the end of this uh, leadership training course. And, and I want to really get a little up close and personal tonight and the topic for tonight is leading in the storm staying consistent and what a topic because uh this is something that mm, is the is it, it's the thing that makes or breaks leaders it's the thing that makes or breaks anyone to, to be able to go through the storm and come out at the other at the other end intact, come out at the other end with growth, come out at the other end on the other side of the storm with 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 with, with, with uh, uh, what David called the spoils. But there is a skill. There is a skill in going through the storm. And I want to talk about fear. I can talk about so many things, how, how you should get through the storm, but I want to speak today about fear. And one of the, the, the realities about leadership is that no matter how good a leader you are, you will encounter challenges. No matter how good a leader you are, you will encounter challenges 
you will, will encounter storms, you will encounter difficulties. It comes with the terrain of leadership. For some people, it is more, and for some people, it's less. But everybody encounters that. And, and it seemed like the, the, if you are the number one person and you are the man in charge or the woman in charge, you, it seemed like your plate is always stuck with challenges. It's always stuck. with difficulties and some kind of storm. So leaders who can get past the fear when the challenges hit are some of the most su successful leaders in the world today. If you can get through the storm, if you can get past the fear that arises during the storm, you will be one of the most successful leaders. Uh, this is um, not to say that you will not be fearful. You know, getting through a storm don't mean that you have to pretend like you're not fearful. You will be fearful, but it's how you deal with the storm depend uh, or determines your survival through the storm. So one of the first response that, G that, that leaders have in the face of challenge is fear. Fear. Then it turns into anger and then blame. And so I want to stop here for a bit and say that a lot of times when leaders are fearful, instead of showing or, or being honest about their fear, they act in denial. Or a lot of times they become angry when they're fearful instead of of showing that fear, they switch to the toughness and they begin to be, they become angry and unkind. So as to mask that fear, but anyone who studies the mind and studies the heart and studies the life knows that wherever there is anger, there is deep seated fear. Whenever someone is constantly angry and betraying anger 
when you get to the heart of that anger and you get to this back story in the back office of their lives, there is always fear. Fear motivates that anger. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse uh, 7, it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Repeating this scripture, when you're, you're a leader, repeat, or anyone, repeating the scripture is no guarantee that you will not be fearful in the storm. This scripture must become a reality in your life. It must become a reality for you before you can see success with the scripture. As, 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 as I like to say, you have to put legs to the scripture. It has to become practical in your life. You have to live the reality of the word to have victory over fear and over anything that the word is talking about. Mm -hmm. fear is a spirit that has taken out countless leaders over the history of time difficult times bring uncertainty uncertainty will result in fear if not dealt with in the right way and this is what we're going to go through i have apostle i have 13 pages for half an hour and I know I'm not going to get through all of that because half an hour is half an hour <laughs> but you know I mean when the revelations are coming you just keep writing and writing and before you know like oh my goodness I have 13 or 14 uh, it's probably about 15 pages but it was a sweet study and Thank you know just writing you know just keep, it, it was beautiful so the word of God has given us strategies to use when we deal with this spirit so we are not left on our own to fight this spirit this is a territorial spirit this is a this is a this is a, a, a strong man in the in the dark realm and he comes and he one of the things that he does he use so many different situations around you to snatch away your purpose and to snatch away the things that god has given to you because the moment you begin to agree with the spirit of fear, when challenges come in your life and when difficulties come and when the storm comes, the moment you begin to agree with the spirit of fear by behaving fearful, thinking fearful, saying fearful things, he has got you. Hand, foot, head, mind, and every part of your being, you have to resist this spirit. But we will continue and we will see how we deal with this spirit. So uh, great leaders plan ahead. All great leaders prepare and uh, plan for the unknown, the unpredictable and the unseen challenges that will come. And when I, when I say prepare, I mean, that before this spirit attacks you, before the storm comes, before difficulty arises, you must be prepared. You must have done prior preparation. You must have uh, uh, gone on the offensive before this spirit attacks you. And so this is one way. A lot, a lot of times we sit down and we just quote the scripture, but you actually have to put the scripture into practical, in, you have to bring it into the practical realm and begin to prepare using the word of God. Amen. So one of the ways that you deal with this spirit is by preparation. Leaders must always be prepared for the storms that will come, whether God allows those storms or whether the enemy comes at you, whether he's trying to sift you, whatever the situation is, you must be ready for him. You must be ready for the spirit of fear. And it happens over and over and over.
and over again, many, many leaders, they get wide-eyed like, like, like a deer in the headlights when situations hit them. And they cut out of control when, when uh, storms and difficulties come to them. And you see the other side of them when they're thrown in the hot water, when they're sitting in the hot water, when they're sitting on the hot seat, when things are not going their way, then you realize, oh my goodness, my leader has some kinks in his armor. My leader has some kinks in her armor and it's coming out now. I'm seeing the other side of this person. But whether or not, my point is, is that leaders must be prepared for the storm. Hmm? Good preparation and prior planning reduces the impact of challenges of the challenges we face and hence limits the power of fear. Question, how prepared are you for the storm that you will have to go through as a leader? There is no romanticism with leadership. Just like there's no romanticize, you, you shouldn't romanticize and, 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 and glamorize the offices that God give us, whether it be apostle, whether it be a uh, evangelist, whether it be um, a prophet, don't, don't, don't glamorize these offices because these offices come with a weight and a price to be paid. And whatever title you hold in the body of Christ, there is a price that you will have to pay to get through the storm. And I'm asking you today, are you ready? Pastors who are listening, a prophetesses, uh, prophets, evangelists, whatever title you hold, are you ready for the storms that will come against you? Or are you one of those leaders who think that you do not need to prepare? Oh, God will handle it. Or maybe you think that you will never have challenges or storms at all. Then this is not the job for you. Leadership is not the thing for you if you think that you will not have storms. My spiritual father is sitting there and he will tell you, I run from my calling as an apostle. Why? Because when I read all the things that happened, that, that the apostles went through and the way they died, I thought to myself, I had enough problems in my life to want an office like that. There is no glamour to these offices. There is no glamour to leadership. And the spirit of fear is one of the, of the most persistent spirits, one of the most persistent demonic forces that will come against you throughout your, your tenor as a, as a leader. Mm -hmm. Leaders are unafraid of storms and challenges. And the reason why they are unafraid is because one, they have gone through enough storms to know that God will bring them through. And second of all, they, are, they have learned that they must be prepared for every storm that they will face. Each season of difficulty provides training ground for great leaders. They learn and grow in each season. When I see the storm coming, when I see storm clouds coming now, I think to myself, it's time to grow, Vonda. When I see that, because I've gone through so many of them already. Now, when I see the storm and I see storm clouds, I'm like, okay, it's time to hunker down. It's time to board up my windows. It's time to curl up and get into some fasting and praying. It's time to heighten my, my, my prayer. It's time to deepen my resolve with God. It's time to get into the word. It's time to hunker down so that I can get through this storm and learn everything that God has allowed this storm to come for. Hmm? In a natural realm, when a hurricane 
is scheduled to hit. The precautionary preparation is dependent on the size and the strength of the storm. Is evacuation needed? Will this storm bring flooding with it? Do we need to board up the windows and the doors? Do we need extra food, fuel, necessities to ride out this storm? Preparation is necessary. My point is vital prior life saving preparations are necessary for survival. If you're going to survive any storm, and if you're going to survive the spirit of fear, which is the most normal response that people have during the time of fear, uh, during the time of, of a storm, you're going to have to prepare. Do your preparation before the storm comes. The church of Jesus Christ, globally, they lived through a pandemic that they were unprepared for, grossly unprepared for. And I assume, I'm assuming that when the next one comes, we will be better prepared for that storm that is looming over the horizon. Read Matthew 20, 24. Jesus said that these things will happen. And so we are, never, we are not going to be surprised again when the next one comes because it's going to come. So I hope that we are all preparing. I'm preparing. I got my stuff ready. I'm buying everything. I, little spaces in my house, I'm putting things together, making sure that I have everything in place. I'm not going to be caught the next time. Because the last time, I had to be declaring faith over fear. <laughs> faith over fear. Faith over fear. You remember that? Yes. Those of you, <laughs> faith over fear, faith over fear. Because sometimes I can tell you, it hit me in the gut. But listen to me, people of God. If you're going to lead the people of God, you as the leader, you must think ahead. You must be the weather man. You must be the weather woman. You must be able to scan the horizon and look. Look into the realm of the spirit because God has given you eyes to see beyond the natural realm, to see what it is that's coming. I must be able to know what is coming so that I will not be caught unawares. When you are not prepared, you are opening the door for the spirit of fear to attack you. Let's go on. So, uh, there are, uh, uh, okay, let me, let me skip a few things because I, I know I'm definitely not going to be able to you got get ten, through all of them. You got 10 minutes more. 10 minutes, ten minutes good. All right. Yeah. So the test of your leadership, the test of your leadership in the storm is the quality of your preparation. Do you as a leader have the ability to foresee and prepare for the storms that will come, for the challenges that you will face as a pastor, for the challenges, and I'm telling you, like unimaginable challenges that you will face as a leader. Sometimes I think to myself, what have I gotten myself into? And I have, I have only just begun. What have I gotten myself into? But guess what? I've gone too far as a leader to turn back. I've gone too far to turn back. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3, it says, the prudent sees the danger and takes refuge. But the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Let me read that again. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 3. The prudent sees danger and takes refuge. But the simple keep going and pay the penalty. In uh, the, the, the New Living Translation says, the prudent 
person uh, foresees danger and takes precaution and the simpleton. I couldn't believe that this 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 <laughs> version falls to people simpleton. It says the simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the con the consequences the consequences. When you fail to prepare for the storms and the challenges you see, and, 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 and you see the cloud, the storm clouds there, and you fail to prepare, you see all the signs, the Spirit of the Lord giving you all the indication that something is about to happen, and you ignore it. Hmm? You open yourself for the spirit of fear, that strong man, to attack you. I remember when the twin towers were hit and the president was there and he was uh teaching you know he had a little session with a kindergarten uh, you know like some some school he was at and someone came and whispered in his ear the twin towers got hit the first one he was like okay okay i guess my people are going to deal with that the second time the person came back to him and said mr president of course, we didn't know what, what they were telling him then. But, but eventually we heard that that's what they said. Mr. President, both towers were hit. You literally see the, the president's eyes open big like that. And he was like shell shocked. He was like staring like that. You could tell when I looked at him now in hindsight, fear gripped him. Fear gripped him. Fear has no uh, respect for anybody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether you are the greatest of all. But what matters is how you handle the situation. Leaders who procrastinate are open to the attacks of fear, negligent, uh, negligent leaders are open to the attacks from the spirit of fear. Leaders who are slothful are open to the attacks of fear. Leaders who fail to prepare are preparing and opening themselves to be attacked by the spirit of fear. Leaders who abdicate their responsibilities are open to the attacks from the spirit of fear. When fear takes over in the storm, panic and confusion comes with it, like we have seen, like we saw during the pandemic when the church was spilling. It's like they didn't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do. Hmm? And the people who knew what to do, their voices were drowned it out. Panic and confusion steps in. When a leader prepares to, uh, uh, fails to prepare, uh, uh, fear and, and, and trepidation steps in. When fear comes during the storm, leaders abdicate their responsibility. Suddenly, pastor gone to Dubai. Suddenly, pastor's not coming to church. Suddenly, pastor giving over the, uh, the responsibility for somebody else to do. One time, there was trouble in a church and the pastor told me, I, you know, I want somebody else to take on the preaching for another two or uh, three months. I said, you must be crazy, Pastor. You have to stand there in the storm and lead. You got to lead through the storm. You cannot become fearful and run away from your responsibility during the storm. How many, how much more time I have, Pastor? Uh, five minutes? <laughs> it's the time stood still. <laughs> All right. I skipped a few things, but I'm coming down to the end here. Let's take a look at David and the way he dealt with a big nine foot storm that came against him. The nine foot storm was Goliath. David had many storms as a leader. And David began to lead as a teenager. When the Philistines came up against Israel, 
from king to 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 all of them down to the bottom from the from the king right down to the army to the regular man nobody stood up to goliath but here comes a young man who god prepared who was preparing in the backside of the desert who was preparing in the pastures who, who was preparing with lions and bears and he was the man for the job the storms that david went through started when he was a young boy and his biggest storm as a teenager was goliath but he was prepared for goliath he had already built and perfected the sling that he was going to use against Goliath, the weapon that will kill Goliath. Long before he used that weapon on Goliath, he was using it against animals with, with, as dangerous as Goliath. That's what I wanted to say. He had already built and perfected the sling if, if you understand the history and what David was doing with that sling, and that is why the men that he trained were so effective, he was tweaking weapons. Just like how he was making musical instruments, he was tweaking the weapons. And, that, and, and people who make weapons, if you study that and you watch documentaries, these people would, would tweak the weapons to give the guns and the, and the different caliber, calibers of, of guns more impact, more force, penetrate armor, all of these things, they tweak those weapons. David was tweaking this sling. In the back, in, in, in the pasture, this, this young man was tweaking it to see how far he could sling, how fast he could sling, and what the impact of his sling would be. And so, Goliath stood no chance against him. This storm that came up against David, he was very prepared for the storm. There was no fear because he was prepared. He wasn't uh, anxious about it because he was prepared. Mm -hmm. He understood what made the sling work more efficiently in his hands. He knew how many circular rotations it needed to sail through the air with the power and the velocity to hit a prey as at a specific distance. He understood that the swift flip of the risk at different angles could create almost unimaginable speed and hit the prey with incredible force. He was tweaking the sling. He understood that his sling could hurl a one ounce stone at 80 miles per hour to hit a target at 600 feet, 650 feet away. So they, ana they analyzed David and the way he used that sling. You see that, that, that giant that he took down? There are people in the, in the, the uh, gun industry who analyzed the way and what David did and how he took down Goliath and they gave you the backstory on this thing. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. He knew that, a, that, that seven to 10 fast rotations, with that he can kill a 600 pound bear or a 500 pound lion. There was a science behind this thing. There was an anointing behind this thing. There was an anointing and a, and a, and a, and a deliberate in intentional preparation that he made. That is why he was able to take out Goliath. He was prepared for the nine foot storm that was challenging the nation of Israel. In addition, David knew which stones were best suited to hit Goliath and take him out. He knew how a dry stone would move through the air when it is flung. He knew that water sto soaked stones from the stream weighed more than the, than the, than the dry stones that were sitting on, the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the grass near the stream. He knew that stones that are sitting in the water got heavier because 
they, 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 they were soaked with the water for so long. They weighed more than the dry stones. He got those, the stones from the stream bed and used them against Goliath. This storm was nothing for David because he was prepared. He knew his weapon. He knew what his weapon could do. He knew how, how, how deadly his weapon was. And when he saw the storm Goliath, he knew that little young teenager who was preparing, with, sitting with his sheep, preparing, flinging his stone, taking out a small target, fling the, 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 release the sling and the stone, picking off a bird out of a tree, picking off an insect, picking off a, 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 something as small as a, as a grasshopper. He knew his weapon. He was prepared. He was ready. And so the spirit of fear could not attack him. But had David not been prepared, Goliath would have taken off his head. He would have been a casualty that day. And a young lad that sat in, 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 in the pastures taking care of sheep was ready for the storm and saved his nation as a result of his preparation. You want to master the spirit of fear. You want to be able to grab that spirit by the neck and beat it down. I'm teaching you a secret here today. You better be prepared. You better learn to not let procrastination rule your life as a leader. You better learn to burn the midnight oil and be ready for when the storm comes. You better know how to deal with these situations when they come from long before. You better understand the terrain that you're leading in and foresee and know what challenges are coming to you and how you're going to deal with those challenges. The spirit of fear will never be able to attack you because with your power, your, lo your love and your sound mind preparation, the spirit of fear is dead. He cannot affect you. He cannot attack you. And even if he does, you are ready and you are prepared. All right. I condensed it. I think my time is up. God bless you. <laughs> Love <Alex>. you. <laughs> God be glory. Fear. Yes. God gives us weapons to fight against that spirit. Power A. Love B. And a sound mind. What a thing that one spirit needs to have three responses in order for you to get over it. But if you're going to lead, if I'm going to lead, if we are going to lead, and we are, we have already established, we are all called to have mastery, all called to have dominion, all called to lead in different areas of skill and relevance to the human condition. And uh, in my discourse with you tonight, I'm going to continue on the same vein. We are talking about leading in the storm. Leading when things are not going nice. And uh, submitting to the deep dealings of God, even as we lead. Because as you lead, you're going to be hit with unexplainable health problems. For no good reason, something in your body will go wrong and stay wrong. You'll rebuke anoint with olive oil, have hands laid on you, have feet laid on you, bleed the blood, bind, loose, decree, declare, and the thing gets progressively worse. Unexplainable health problems. You'll be hit with a storm of disfavor where people that you give your liver for would not give a fingernail that they have cut off to help you in your day of distress. You'll be hit with a storm of almost success, no success, near success, about to succeed, but never quite getting there. You'll be hit with a storm of 
arrows of hatred, unexpected arrows of hatred hurled at you, shot at you by places you did not even know you have an enemy. You're going to be hit with joblessness just when you need the job the most, just when your bills are piling up. The boss said, I'm sorry, but I've got to let you go. You're going to hit with the fact that at times in life, you'll be a wandering vagabond, a wandering star. You are a star, but you have no fixed place in the sky. You can't be found if they go looking for you with binoculars the next day because you have moved from that spot. Nobody knows where to find you because the vagabond storm has come upon you and you keep moving from place to place with no significant accomplishment. You're going to be hit with confusion. You're going to be hit with disappointment. You're going to be hit with academic frustration. You know you're bright. Everybody else know you got the brain to get the thing done. Other people getting their bachelors, other people getting their masters, other people getting their doctorate. And there you are with academic frustration. When it's not the right time, you don't have the right money. When you have the right money, it's not the right time. Academic frustration. You'll be hit with hardship, things not going right for you. You'll be hit with funny dreams. You can't even sleep in peace. You'll be hit with marital distress. You'll be hit with insecurity. You'll be hit with strange accidents that come at you when you the last thing you want was for a scratch on the car. You'll be hit with spiritual, constant spiritual attacks, spirit beings attacking you in your sleep and in your waking hours poltergeists and ghosts, shadows passing you in the house, sudden cold breath in the room, hair standing on end, ears standing up, and you feel that heckle on your back like when the dogs are ready to fight. Oh yes, you'll be hit with stagnancy. You'll be hit with strange women who come at you for no reason. You know you're not Mr. World. You know you're not uh, the handsomest thing in the place. And yet Miss World and Miss Universe are running you down and you have to run for your life. And people, you know, they say you are from the other community because you're not responding the way that men ought to respond. You're gonna be hit with leaking pockets. Many, uh, a whole lot of blessing, many blessings coming, much money coming at your disposal. And in a day or two, you don't know where it went. Leaking pockets. It seemed like there is something eating away at your resources. The other storm you're going to be hit with, I'm talking from experience here. I'm talking from Bible and I'm talking from, look, after 44 years of ministry, you know a thing or two about a thing or two. Not much, but you know a thing or two. And I'm picking out the big ones that hit. So you will know they will hit you too. You're going to be hit with disappearing helpers. Disappearing helpers. Reverends, you watching me right now. And you who are going to be reverent, there'll be time in your ministry when everybody's coming to help you. There'll be time in your ministry when some skilled people are coming to help you. There'll be time in your ministry when people come to help you, but you find out that instead of them helping you, they need help and you got to help them. That God did not really send them to help you, but he sent them for, for you to help them. Because having studied them for a minute or two, you figure out this is a talentless no anointing, lack of discipline, son of a motherless goat that has shown up here and they need more training than I'm willing to give. You're going to be hit with nonstop fighting with no reprieve. Fights are going to break out against you. You don't know why. You didn't start it. And every time you speak for peace, they are for war. You're going to be hit with, this is the worst one of them all. You're going to be hit with prayer paralysis. You know you must pray. You, you, you know you're convicted to pray. You're convinced about the power of prayer. But the only thing is, you can't pray. Not that you don't want to pray. You want to pray. But to say, our Father, it seems like a 20-ton truck is on top of your head and a 40-ton truck is under your jaw and it hasn't given you an inch so you can't move and you can't pray. You are going to be hit with prayer paralysis. Your prayer life will be paralyzed. The Bible will look like a Greek book that you don't understand a word that it's saying. You're going to be hit with prayer paralysis. If, if you don't write down nothing else that I say, you'll write this one down because it's coming. Prayer paralysis. 
You're going to be hit with that storm. You're going to be hit with evil diversion. You're diverted off course. And most of the time, it's a well-meaning ministry thing that you're diverted to. And that thing will take you in and ch put you chasing down a rabbit hole. And the more rabbits you see, the more you run, the more you run, the tighter you get, and you're not catching any rabbit. You're going to be hit with evil diversion that looks like a ministry opportunity. They're going to name some big bucks to get you there. And once you get there, you're running for your life and you're not getting success. And at the end of the day, they have no box to give you. They just use that as a lure to get you in. You're going to be hit with the loss of good things. You're going to be hit with the loss of good things. Good things in your life are going to be vanishing like nobody's business. And there's nothing that you can do to get it going. And in the midst of all of that, when you're hit and the storm is raging every which way, God wants you to maintain an even keel. God wants you to maintain good character i'm going to tell you something that will shock you god is not interested in your giftedness god is not interested in your anointing if those two things are in and of itself what you depend on to do ministry you are wasting precious time it would not be long before you crash and burn god wants character to balance the scale are you feeling a brother my reputation is intact if my character is good. My reputation is intact if my character is good. If my character is not good, you can build all the reputation you want. Like the proverbial Humpty Dumpty, you're going to come down. It is the hard quality that paves the way for character development. The quality of your heart, the condition of your heart. We have very many skilled, gifted people in the kingdom and they bring such reproach and disgrace to the house of God because character is not a part of their discipline. Their heart is not right with God, but they are gifted, they are talented, they are charismatic, they can hoop and holler, and they can get plenty, plenty likes. And you know, in today's world, we gotta have those likes or else we don't even feel like we're born again. When God wants a vessel of honor, he allows storms to reveal and develop character in that vessel of honor. Uh, Paul writing to the church, he says, in a, in, a, in a good house, there are vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. If a man wants to become a vessel of honor, he's going to, the man is going to have to purge himself, cleanse himself, prepare himself, get himself ready so that God can uh, promote him from where he is to becoming a vessel of honor. And one of the ways that God prepares vessels of honor, pay attention now, is that he's going to allow storms, and these storms, when they come, they come to reveal character or the absence of character. And secondly, they come to develop character in you, being tossed to and fro, back and forth, holding on to God for dear life and not letting go, having done all your stand. Hey, 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 hey. And so when God wants a vessel of honor, he allows storms to reveal and to develop the character. Anointing is not enough. Elijah could call fire down from heaven, but he was a man full of self-pity and suicidal tendencies. I am the only one left. He was embittered by persecution complex, thinking that he was the only one that was tasting the heat for God. Samson could carry away the gates of Gaza, but one sexy woman swinging her hips, lips, and fingertips in front of him, and he fell apart like a deck of cards. Judas had the best leader. Judas cast out demons, but he had sticky fingers. And he was full of betrayal and greed. His character was not developed. Gifts, listen to me good. Gifts are freely given. So when a person is in full demonstration of all this giftedness, he didn't do anything to earn it. It was given free. And so it is not something that he got by discipline. Gifts are not given by discipline. Gifts are not given by perseverance. Gifts are not given by faithfulness. Gifts are given freely. You did nothing to earn it. So when somebody is gifted, we don't have to sing their praise and put them on a pedestal. They did nothing to get that gift. It was graciously given by God and it was given freely. They did not earn it. Gifts are freely given, but character development takes time. Character development takes work. Character development takes submission. Character development takes effort that is necessary. Character development takes a lifetime and consistent walking with God. And character development does not end until you die. So God is always going to be sending storms 
to develop your character and mine. Why is he doing it? Because there is something that he wants. In Genesis 1, 26, he gave us his image, A. He gave us his likeness, B. He gave us a dominion mandate, C. In Galatians 4 and 9, Paul said, writing to the church of Galatia, I travail in birth. I am in pain until Christ is formed in you. What does he mean by that? He wants to bring the Galatian church to a place where people can look on them and see Christ being formed in them, that they reflect the image of Jesus Christ. God in Genesis 1 and 26, give us his image and his likeness. He wants us to be stamped with that image and likeness. We fell into sin, we messed it up, but God still wants it. And whatever he has to do to develop it in you, the image and likeness of his son that he gave us in the beginning, when he gave man his image and likeness, he's working to get that back. And storms are a way of pruning away until the image of Christ is formed. Galatians uh, 4, verses number 9. In Ephesians 4 and 13, he says, until we all come to a perfect man, until we all come to a mature man, until we all come to that place in ministry and in our kingdom life, that we are no longer petty Christianettes listening to sermonettes and smoking cigarettes, that we are not easily tossed and tossed and tossed to and fro, but we are resolute and we are able to stand having done all. We become a mature man. God wants the image of Christ in you and God wants the image of Christ in me. God wants the reflection of Christ in you and he wants the reflection of Christ in me. And one way to do it is to send the storm to blow out every antichrist thing that is inside of us. When men fail, fell, when men fell, we fail to produce God's image. But God is not phased. God is not discouraged. He wants what he wants. In Hebrews 2 and 10, it says, to perfect the altar of their salvation through suffering. Jesus, through suffering, was perfected as the author or the writer or the initiator or the beginner of salvation. If the man who brought salvation was perfected by persecution, was perfected by the storms that he went through. Do you think that you would be exempt? You've got another thing coming. God wants to bring many sons to glory. What is glory? Glory is the manifestation of the hidden gifts, talents, abilities, and wealth that God has put inside of you. He wants to bring many sons to glory to the place where they manifest what he is. And his leaders, that's you and me, we must lead the way. But in order for us to lead the way, he must develop his sons so that his sons can develop the people. He must develop the leaders so that the leaders can develop the people. We, in this present church age and kingdom age, we emphasize gifts. We emphasize talent. We emphasize anointing. We emphasize charisma instead of character development. This lopsided approach has led to many a scandal because the lifestyle of the gifted are overlooked. If gifts attract and have a buzz to it, we, we allow people with all kinds of questionable character flaws to serve and to serve in high positions because they are able to get the buzz, they are able to get the hype, they are able to get the likes, they are able to get the comments coming. <clears throat> True leadership, now hear me and hear me strong, this is my salient point of all salient points. True leadership, Balances, gifts, anointings with character. True leadership will balance the giftings and the anointings and the graces with character. It will not allow our charisma and giftedness and anointings to run roughshod just because it is attracting an audience. That when you're a true leader, you're going to pull them over and say, come sit, have a seat, have a seat, have a seat. I don't want any more likes. Have a seat. Let's work on you. Let's work on your foul attitude. Let's work on your rotten way you talk to people. Let's work on the way you're verbally abusive. Let's work on the way you slapped your wife last night as she was going to the car. Let's wa work on the way you shoved her last week and you think nobody saw you. Let's work on the way that you screamed at your mother-in-law. Let's work on the way you cut in front of the driver when you came out of church and then you give him the middle finger and you call yourself a man of God. We don't want to, to pull people up for their uh, flaws and for their obvious unscriptural lifestyle just because they're gifted or because they're rich or because they pay big tides or because they drive a flashy car 
and we are happy because a doctor is coming to our church or a lawyer is coming to our church or a chief engineer, some big job is, or the governor comes to a church once in a while, we will allow anything to happen in the house of God if it creates a buzz or if it brings in two more people. Now hear me and hear me strong. In Proverbs 11 and 1, the Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Much like everything else is an abomination that he calls an abomination, it remains an abomination. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. God delights in what? A just weight. God delights in what? In balance. But, he says, a false balance is an abomination. When we allow giftedness and anointing to go ahead on the scale without any character to balance it, that false balance is an abomination to God. Gifted people who are anointed with rotten attitudes are an abomination to God. That's not me saying that. Don't look at me like that. I know I'm preaching good. Character. Character. That's the, the inner life. Character. It is displayed under pressure. That's the only time you'll know when character is there. That is why God sends the storm to reveal to you who you are, to reveal to the people that are following you who you are, to reveal to the audience that loves you who you really are, because once they see who you really are, they can never forget that stuff. You can't hide anymore. That's why God sent the storm, because had the people seen Jim Jones or who he was, 900 plus Americans would not have died. Character are your thoughts, your values, your motivation, your attitudes, your feelings, your actions. Talents are developed in privacy. Talents are developed in privacy. But character is formed by stormy weather. And God wants character. And that is why ever so often in your life, you are going to have stormy weather. Because stormy weather is what forms character. Character is a distinct mark. It is a distinct mark. It is a mark that is impressed upon. It is a mark that is otherwise formed by an outside force or sometimes by an internal force. Character is formed by pressure upon an individual. Christ was stamped by the Father. He carried the character of the Father. And he said, if you see me, you see the Father. This here in my hand is our church seal, our church stamp our church embosser. Inside of it with these two hard pieces of plastic is the image, the seal with the name of the organization. I have to press down upon this lever here and then with all of my might, I have to squeeze until the lever touches the bottom and when it lifts off, what is on the embosser what is on the seal, what is on the church stump, gets on the certificate, gets on the diploma, gets on the paper, gets on whatever is being sealed or stamped or embossed, or the character of the stamp, the seal, the embosser, is now placed on the paper. It's an identical replica of that which is on the embosser. That's what character is. It's a distinct mark. No matter, you could be black, but you have the mark of God on you. You could be white, you have the mark of God. You could be polka dotted, but you have been distinctly marked, stamped, embossed. But that image of the embosser of the seal does not get on there without applied pressure. I've got to put my weight on it. Sometimes I've got to squeeze until I feel it in my bones and I hold it there because I know. It's biting into the paper. And when I lift it off, it's going to leave its stamp of approval. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the father. My behavior is like the father. I have a heart. I have a tongue. I have a mouth. I speak like my father. Somebody say, oh, rocker shocker. Yes, yes. Character is not what you're going to be. Character is not what you used to be. Character is what you are now. It isn't the nice voice. Character isn't the nice poise. 
Carter isn't the nice dress. Carter isn't the beautiful English and the rounded tones. Carter is not the suave outward appearance. Carter is not knowing how to behave in public, knowing what to look like, how to look in public, knowing how to set your facial expression in public, knowing how to wave your hands like Queen Diana a Princess Diana in the public. You, all of these things can be right, and yet that person can be rotten to the core. Pretty face, but bad character. Pretty face, but bad ways. Are you feeling it, brother? Yes. Character isn't the nice voice. It is not the poise. It is the inner thoughts. It is the inner motive. It is who a person really is. Are you feeling it, brother? Glad to have uh, the good Boaz with us. But listen to this, character needs pressure for it to appear. Like I would apply the pressure on the embosser on the seal. Character needs pressure for it to appear. That nice poised person that's acting all stoosh, like butter couldn't melt in their mouth. You put some pressure on them. You put some weight on them. You get their goat. You say something that gets under their skin. You say something that they don't like. And then the real gorilla will come out of the little monkey. And just when you thought you had a Saki Winky to deal with, here comes King Kong. And he's gonna take over the tongue and stomp some houses and break some uh, helicopters and fling them away because the, the quiet man has become the incredible hulk. Yes, Carter needs pressure to appear. Heat reveals it. It's storms unveil it. Pressure makes it surface. And that's why God sends heat. That's why God sends storms. That's why God sends pressure. That's why you're having it right now. Can you still lead under pressure? Do you explode and get testy? Do you get verbally abusive? You know what the scripture says? It says men look at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. The heart is the seat of the emotion. Character is the life worth emulating. Do people want to emulate you when they see you blow your top? blow a fuse and bust the gasket. Character is how we treat the non-believer. They must be treated with the same modicum of respect that you treat the other people of God. You cannot disregard a person of another religion or race just because you don't like them and you can't stand them and you were told that they are monkeys and you need to throw bananas to them. Are you feeling a brother? Character is needed when times are difficult to handle, but men love self, they're fond of money. We have in our world a wrong value system. We have uh, uh, many uh, braggarts who are haughty, disrespectful of God and men. They have no value system. There's a spirit of rebellion against parents. Ingratitude and ungratefulness is normal in today. I'm showing what the absence of character looks like so that you will know it when you see it. Yes, our people have become immoral, unholy, unfeeling. They do not keep their promise. They do not keep their word. They are false accusers. They have no constraint. They are headstrong. They display no self-control. They treat their friends shamefully. They are betrayers. They are rash. They are reckless. They have religion without change. They are hypocrites. They are scoffers, mockers. They make up unbiblical rules and they are full of false teaching. Let me say to you preachers that are out there, and let me say it strong. Quit teaching your own opinion. We don't want to hear it. We had enough of you and your pomposity and your arrogance. Now here, all that I just mentioned are negative character traits, and yet that's all we see on display in the world. That is why there is no shortcut for character, for discipline, and for submission to God and his word, and it will take some time to produce it. To produce what? Character. Why does God send the storm and is it necessary? Yes, it is necessary. Let me tell you why he sends it. God sends the storm to sculpt the vessel, S-C-U-L-P-T. Yeah, Philippians 1 and 6, he who began the good work in you is faithful to complete it. The work that God is doing to you in the storm, he calls it a good work. In Psalm 32, verse 4 and 5, he says, for day and night, Thy hand, O God, was heavy upon me. Why was it heavy? He was producing character. He was embossing you. He was sealing you. He was stamping you with his stamp of approval. Yes, Hebrews 10, 32. 
I'm quoting the end of the script. He said, you endured a great fight of affliction. You endured a great fight of affliction. What is God doing in the storms of affliction? He is giving you some level of endurance that you can stand up to pressure and not buckle and fall apart. In Psalms 119, verse 6 to 7, it says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. Now when? Now that I'm afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. When there is no affliction, when there is no storm, the tendency is to do what you like and to go astray. The easiest thing is to stray. But when that heavy hand of discipline comes on you, then he says, but now I have kept thy word. God sends the storm to make us keep his word. He is doing a saving work to prevent us from backsliding. That's why he sends the storm. In Hebrews 12, verse 7, it says, if you endure chastening, God had dealt with you as a son. What? If you endure chastening, what does that mean? God sends the storm of chastening to reveal sonship, that you're still a son, and to reveal his fatherhood. What is the purpose of the storm? In Leviticus 1, 7 and 17, the purpose of the storm is to bring out the sweet smell. In Psalm 12 and verse 6, the purpose of the storm is to get rid of the dross as silver that is tried seven times. The purpose of the storm, according to Daniel 3, 22 to 27, is to burn off the bondage. The boys were thrown in the fire, bound, but the fire, the storm, burnt off the chains and the ropes that tied them up and freed them. The storm is to burn off the bondage. First Corinthians 3 and 13, the storm is to reveal your works, to show you what quality of works you're really producing. The storm comes to reveal your Judas and to reveal to Peter that he still depends on a sword for all his big talk and for all his boasting that he cast out demons in Jesus' name. He was still a carnal man. And when the real pressure hit, he reverted to his cutlass and swung and could have taken the man's head off had he not ducked. It took Jesus' expert plastic surgery to put the man's ear back in place. Yes. In making the sweet smell in the storm, incense has to be crushed to release its aroma. In the Old Testament, one of the things that they were making for the, for the tabernacle was incense. But the spices that they got the incense from, it had to be crushed to release its aroma. The sweet smelling savor, that's what it is. God wants to produce sweet smelling savor from you. That's why he sends the storm to crush you so that what is inside of you will come out. And some people, when they get crushed, they cuss. One pastor said, it just came out. I don't know how it came out. He let out some bad word and the brethren looked in shock. Pastor? He said, I don't know what just happened. It just came out. No. No, it was in you, out of the abundance of the cussing in your heart, your mouth spoke. So we knew that this brother had a lot of cuss down there. Are you feeling me now? The candlestick that was used in the tabernacle was a piece of gold. The gold had to be melted and it had to be hammered and beaten into shape. It had to pass through the fire to melt. Then the hammer had to be beating on it so that it could be a light bearer. The gold had to be heated up, one. The gold had to be beaten up, two. And then it had to be shaped up, three. And then it had to be held up, four. And then it had to be lit up, five. When finally it showed up, six. The dark world needs your light. And that's why God sends the winds of fire and the hammer storms to beat you into one vessel so that he can hold you up to the world. And you can be the light of the world. Nobody gets to be a candlestick until they get beaten and bashed and burned and melted. But the fact of the matter is they were chosen to perform that great work. Yes, all of the boards in the sanctuary had to go through stripping. All of the boards in the sanctuary had to go through cutting. All of the boards in the sanctuary had to go through carving to be fitted into their place as a thing of beauty. You're going to have to be chosen. You're going to have to be stripped. You're going to have to be cut. You're going to have to be carved. And you're going to have to be whittled down to fit into the place so that you can reflect a thing of beauty to the honor, to the praise, and to the glory of God Almighty. Why is God passing you through the storm and making you a leader? 
to produce the image of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, he's doing it to change your form as the caterpillar has to give up all them legs to be a butterfly, but the two wings will take it further, faster than all them legs. God is allowing the storm to create in you metamorphosis, transformation, a change of heart, a change of mind, and a change of power. In Malachi 3 and 12, he talks about the fuller soap, the fuller soap. You become like the fuller soap. For a beautiful garment to be made, there was a tradesman who was called the fuller. The fuller will take the material because the material was brought from a far country. And the material will be brought on caravan. And along the way, the caravan wheel and everything else would kick up dust. The dust will get into the fabric. The dust will get into the material. The fuller now, the guy who would work with the fabric, would take the material to a nearby brook. And he would lay it on some flat stone. He had in his hand what is called a fuller's club, with which he would beat the garment. The dust would begin to drop and rise, and the running brook would wash it away. Now, on this fuller's club, there were some iron teeth that would get the dust out and get the filth removed so that it could be made suitable into a beautiful garment. Now, you need to understand that even though the fuller had a big, heavy club, and the club had these iron teeth in them, the fuller was beating delicately because he did not want to destroy the fabric. He did not want to tear the fabric. He did not want to mess with the fabric. And though he was beating it, he was beating it lightly. He was beating it enough so that it would not be destroyed, but so that it could be removed from the water, from the brook, and made into a suitable, beautiful garment. God allows the storm because he sees that you are going to be a beautiful garment on display. Everybody's going to want to buy you. Everybody's going to want to wear you. Everybody's going to want to try you out. Everybody's going to want to take a picture with you. Everybody's going to want your signature. Everybody's going to want a photo with you to show John Public that I was with celebrity. I was with the creme de la creme of the kingdom of God. But before you get there, before I get there, before we get there, we are going to have to go through the beating, the cleansing, the being made suitable. Because when the beating and cleansing was done, he still had to cut to suit. He still had to cut to fit. He still had to cut to sew. He still had to pass some pins through it. He still had to sew the hem. Are you feeling a brother up in here? Up in here. The fuller does not beat to shred. The fuller does not beat to rip, but he beats to cleanse for usefulness. Why does God allow the storm? To cleanse you so that you can become a clean and useful vessel for the purpose for which you, hey, 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 the purpose for which you are called. God isn't trying to hurt you, but to make you A, clean, and to make you B, suitable. He wants to make you A, clean, and B, presentable. And then, God sends the storm to make us fruitful, to remove the dead branches in John 15. He prunes this vine that is productive. Now, I was shocked. I thought he pruned the vines that were not productive, that were dead. No. He cut away the dead ones because they are non-productive anyhow, but they are still taking up the sap from the vine, still enjoying the sap from the vine, but they are not producing any fruit. And so he cuts back the the parts that are producing. Yes, he cuts away the fruitless branches. He purges the one that produces fruit. He refines it. He cuts the fruit bearing branches. One of the signs of the storm, one of the messages that the storm tells you, the storm tells you that you are fruitful. The storm is telling you that you are productive. The storm is telling you that the master is paying attention to you. But the storm is also telling you that the master is coming to you with his pruning knife. <laughs> You're about to get cut again. Are you feeling it, brother? To increase fruitfulness. His work, the work of the storm and the work God allows, is always A, positive, and B, redemptive. The more the fruitfulness, the more the pruning. Have you been pruned lately? Have you felt the knife lately? 
Have you felt the cut lately? Have you felt a second cut lately? Have you felt a third and a fourth cut lately? Sometimes I just throw up my hands in this bay. I don't want to be fruitful anymore because this fruitfulness just getting you cut, cut, and more cut. But the more fruitful you are, the more cuts you will get. Are you feeling a brother up in here? The purpose of the storm is to make you more fruitful. The purpose of the storm is to prepare a vessel for service in 2 Timothy 2, 19 and 20, from shaping to taking out of the oven. Much work is needed. According to Jeremiah 17, 1 to 10, he talks about the Lord has chosen me and called me from afar and yeah, 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 yeah. The potter's field, the potter, is full of vessels that would have been great vessels. The potter's field is the place where they bury vessels that didn't quite come out right. It's where they throw away vessels that didn't quite respond to the treatment and to the molding. It is a place where would-be great vessels are. They would have been great, but they could have been great, but they should have been great, but they did not respond well to the kiln, to the firing, or to the molding of the potter's hand. They got bent and twisted and out of shape. They were not properly formed. In Matthew 27, 1 to 10, Judas hung himself in a potter's field. Doesn't that tell you something prophetic? He was a spoiled vessel. He could have been a great apostle. He could have been a great disciple. He could have wrote some books in the, in the New Testament. But this joker was full of dishonesty, crookery, and treachery. And he ended up in the potter's field where all the other vessels like himself would not allow the master to mold them, would not allow the master to make them, would not allow the master to bake them, would not allow the oven to get out all of the moisture from them. And so they cracked and fizzled and bent and chiseled and became useless. And that's why he sends the storm. God wants to enlarge our lives. According to Isaiah 54 and 2, enlarge the place of thy tent. Enlarge your capacity. In 2 Samuel 23 and 37, the Lord shall enlarge thy steps. Thy steps, that means your walk. In Isaiah 54 and 2, he will enlarge your habitation, your capacity. In 1 Samuel 23 and 37, he will enlarge your steps. In 1 Chronicles 4 and 10, he will enlarge your vision. In Isaiah 60 and 5, he will enlarge your heart. In 1 Samuel 2 and 1, he will enlarge your confession. In 2 Corinthians 6, 11 to 13, he will enlarge your ministry. Yes, yes, and yes. And then finally, in Hosea 5 and 15, it says, in their affliction, they will seek me early. In their affliction, they will seek me early. What is God doing in the storm? He's making us to seek him. He's leading us to the rock that is higher than we are. He's making us to know that I am God and you are not. And if you don't serve me willfully, deliberately, and out of a heart of love, I will allow storms to come your way that will drive you to me because you can be driven to destruction or you can be driven in the arms of sweet deliverance. It depends on where you want to go. And so in conclusion, I'm saying to everybody and their mother and their mother-in-law, storms are going to come, but the storms are an indicator that we are about to become useful, productive, fruitful, put on display with capacities enlarged, vision, heart, confession enlarged, ministry enlarged. And then the good thing about this is when you have the character that balances the gifts, talents, and abilities, oh yes, it is a, it is a scale that God is happy with because a false balance is an abomination, but a balanced scale is his delight. When you bring your character in line with your anointing and gifting, it is a scale that God delights in. God wants to delight in all of us. And I trust that something we said, something that was said, something that was done during this six months, and really and truly we got nine months of information because I did do that uh, leadership principles of Jesus. And I sat down for 24, uh, 24 hours or 12 hours. 
12 hours. So that's three, four is 12. That's three months. So we did six months, but we got nine months of information. And before the, uh, before the graduation, I may throw in one or two more as just icing on the cake. It was a joy to have you all with us. What a blessing it was. I am very glad that you considered yourself of such value that you were willing to invest a measly hundred bucks in this training session that we went through. I applaud you and I say to God be the glory for the great finish that you have finished with us. God bless you all as you go forward and lead in every area in your church life, your business life, your family life, and your ministry life. I'm going to give the next minute to Apostle Gaspar to wrap it up and to say goodbye. God bless. The boom is out. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, as Apostle was, was, was talking, there's something that really resonated with me. Um, he spoke about prayer paralysis. And it is one of the most shocking attacks that you could ever have in your life as a, as a leader. Prayer paralysis is something that comes at you with 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 a lot of fierce yeah. aggression mm -hmm. uh, to the point where you you sometimes want to question whether you actually have a relationship with God yep. or not. Uh, you 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 question your your salvation. You you, yep. you you ask yourself, what is wrong with me? What am I doing? Why am I not able to do this? And then. Uh, after a couple of months, it spits you out and you feel like you're on top of the mountain. And then before you know it, here comes that prayer paralysis creeping back in to your life. But as a leader, when you can conquer that prayer paralysis, that spirit that comes against you, when you can conquer that spirit, that is one of the most foundational and powerful victories that you can have that even when you feel it coming you get up and you move on discipline and grit and you show up every day to pray and to talk to God sometimes when you show up to pray your mind goes blank your mouth wants to move but your mind is blank you don't even know what to say but when 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 you can and, and you know Apostle, I went through that for a number of years. And then one day the Lord said to me, don't pray. Don't, don't come to me because you feel like praying. Come to me even when you don't feel like coming. Yep. And discipline yourself to call upon my name. Do it. Do, pray and talk to me uh, in those times when you're being attacked the same way as when you are on top of the mountain. And so when you can bring yourself to that place to conquer that spirit that wants to stop you from, from oh. talking to God and from praying and from, from wielding the most powerful us, uh, weapons that you can have, you have come to a place of maturity as a leader. And so as I close tonight, I want to remind you that no matter what comes against you in the storm, no matter what happens in the storm, keep prayer. Hold on to prayer. Make sure that you show up every day to flesh it out with God. Because that sometimes prayer is the only thing that makes sense sometimes in the storm. <laughs> <coughs> only thing that makes sense that's the only weapon that you have and you say to god god this is all i have i have nothing else never let go of prayer no matter what happens no matter what happens never let go of prayer. that is the thing that will bring you through in every single situation whether you conquer the spirit of fear 
whether you conquer um, uh, um, prayer par uh, paralysis, whatever it is you, you, you're dealing with, hold on to prayer. Show up every day and talk to God and let him talk to you. God bless you all. This has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful training session for the people of God. I trust that you have been collecting all of the messages and keeping them in your archives so that you can go back to them and, uh, you know, just go over those messages again. Uh, the, the amount of work that has been done on this leadership training program should give us a couple of volumes of books, like uh, volume one, two, three, and four, maybe amen, up to amen. five or six, right? And so um, I trust tonight that you have collected that valuable information so that uh, you can refer back to it as a manual for leadership. God bless you, and thank you for the opportunity. Bye, everybody. Thank you for everything. God Bye. bless. Amen. Bye. Thanks for everything. Right, Bye. Good night, apostles, and everyone else. Good night, I reckon. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank good, you. Night. good night. Thank you. Good night, apostle. Good night, Apostle Gaspar. Good night, Papa. Love night. you. Good I know night. you. Good night. Don't see me anymore. <laughs> Apostle Jasper, Reverend Ezebom, good night. God bless you. Thanks for God sharing. Good night and thank You're you welcome. for joining us. I know that voice too. <laughs> yes. Yeah.